the emphasis of this uh, session is to look at search engine optimization. And if you think about virtuality and the machines that are running our lives, if you think about Google and how infectious it is in the way that it is transforming our uh, behavior or the things that we do on a daily basis and how it affects almost our daily decision making, that's obviously quite scary. So therefore, the ethics behind it is quite an important point. So those people who help us to see the view of the world through Google are called SEO, so Search Engine Optimization Professionals. And I'm really grateful today we've got uh, four Search Engine Optimization Professionals that were experts in their field, and uh, they are going to share with us some of their views on the ethics and the importance of ethics when it comes to Search Engine Optimization. So, uh, well, we've got uh, the following running order. We've got uh, Andrew, Nick, Julie, and Sophie. Julie is with us virtually. Hi to Julia. Yeah, all right, I'm Cam. Uh, Andrew Exon, uh, work at Venn, um, which are in Wilmslow, so not too far from here. Um, I started out in a content background, so I started as a journalist, and then got into the link building when link building was allowed, which is a few years ago now. Um, then got into proper agency life at Venn, uh, started as a tech SEO and made my way into Heavy Digital now. So I always look everything across a client strategy from, from beginning to end. Are we doing the right thing uh, for them and for us? Um, and we look after some pretty big clients now. So we've got the Corderly, which is side of plan. We've got Airport City, we've got Baco, we've got JWE pubs. Um, yeah, pretty well-known companies now, um, which is a far cry from when I started and we had a few recruiters that no one's ever heard of and no one will ever probably hear of ever again. Um, okay, so who is responsible for ethical SEO? So, in the real world, who's responsible for ethics? It's probably ourselves and then it's governed by the police in some, in some regard, so the police say, if you've done something wrong, you're getting locked up. That's that's how it goes in terms of ethics. So online and digitally, not in online marketing, who's responsible again? Ultimately it's us. But you've got Google, who was more or less a monopoly in our industry, um, policing that. So in America it's slightly different. I think Google have around sixty-five percent market share, something like that, isn't it? Whereas here it's 85% officially, but the traffic I see every day is probably near 95% of organic traffic comes from Google. Um, so it's, it is a monopoly. So essentially, they are policing our ethics. And Penguin, do you all know about Penguin and backlinks and what it is? No? So Penguin is, is if you're building. Uh, backlinks to manipulate their algorithm. So Google say the two biggest parts of their algorithm are Penguin and Panda. But, but Penguin and Panda. Panda's about content, quality content. Pe Penguin's about links. And once that lit, that algorithm runs, it'll either say you've done good or you've done bad. So if you've done bad, you go under this algorithm, and in more or less your organic traffic will go. You might lose ninety percent of traffic. You lose extreme amount of traffic. Now Google did this algorithm, I haven't run it since December 2014, so that's nearly two years of people being in, in under that algorithm and then they're stuck, they can't go anywhere, so that's businesses going out of work or they've had to start a new domain and, and start afresh. Um, so ultimately, in my mind, you've got to hold Google responsible for ethics. We're living by their rules as we do with life, will it by the government's rules. Okay, so what should practitioners' responsibility be in terms of ethics? Um, I think we've got to listen to what Google says, so they give us guidelines, they give us webmaster guidelines, a day to this, a day to this, and a day to this. But you can also go beyond that and, and and do it your own way. So like we were saying earlier, you can have a client who says, I just want to get to the top of Google, get as much traffic as I can, wait till I get penalised, and we're done. Um, and if, if you if you agree to that, the client agrees to that, and, and, and an agency agrees to that, then that's fine. Um, but if you, but in most instances, clients think long term, they want, a, they want a brand to go from A to B, 
they want to gain long-term custom, they want to gain uh, brand evangelism, customers keep coming back and coming back. Now as an agency that's up to us to create that and if you manipulate algorithms then you're not long term that's not going to happen. You're going to lose you're going to lose a brand because it'll go under Penguin or it'll go under Panda or it'll go one, under one of the other hundred and odd algorithms they've got. You've got to do things right, you've got to treat Google as a person and they give you a lot of the guidelines of what what to follow. So as long as you follow that, technically you should be okay. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, th thank you. Uh, so over so what should client responsibilities be in terms of SEO? So you said the person don't think they have many. So the client of an SEO a a agency, I guess, or um, I don't think clients have any responsibility. They're not bothered. Um, they are bothered as long as they're getting business. Why would a client be bothered how, they, how they're doing online? As long as that that repeat custom comes and, and they're seen as ethical, in however shape or form that is, they are bothered how they get the money. Okay. Yeah. So that's all thanks to Google then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, Andrew. So, uh, all right, so I gather you're quite interested in philosophical arguments and more conceptual things, so I'll go on that level as much as I can. Just to introduce myself, I, uh, I've been in online marketing since 1999, and in 2006, I got a gig working with a company called Betfair as their SEO manager, and I worked there for four years, and then I became head of search, which is all things to do with search engines, and that's paid and, and, uh, and organic. And then in 2012, I set up my own agency called 90 Digital, and uh, we specialize in iGaming, and we're part of the ICS Media Group, so I think it's across the board there's about 60 of us in the agency. In 2015, having been in the, around the block for years on watching other people do iGaming things, I thought, let's set up a casino. So uh, I worked with a partner, uh, called Soft Swiss. They handle the operations side, we do the marketing, we focus on cryptocurrency, which is a niche. It's a good idea to start somewhere, so we figured crypto is a good place to start. And uh, I spend a lot of time really kind of wading around in the dark, as it were, on ethics, because the edges are very, very soft. And it one. It's easy to move too far left to right, and then you end up in a bad place. I, my core ethical code is don't be evil. Uh, Google used to use that as a code, but they don't any longer, by the way. But anyway, let's just talk about what ethical SEO is. And just on a really high level, we were ch ch chatting about this earlier. The first question is, what is ethics? And I would argue that ethics are the rules which are agreed to. Therefore, you can have one set of ethics for one group and another set of ethics for another group because the rules are different and you could be the same entity. So I think that's an interesting thing. And the other thing that's very interesting about this ecosystem is it's a bit like the French resistance. So in search engine optimization, our job is to do well on Google. Fundamentally, we are either doing the bidding for an organization that sole remit is to make money for its shareholders, or we're doing the bidding on behalf of our clients who pay us, or, or, or we're doing our own business to do well on Google, whatever, the, whatever the, the consequences, as long as they're not too risky. So it's very, it's very gray, and it's very broad. So anyway, I, my, my general view is, as I said, very simply, ethics is agree to the rules that you agree to, to follow. So it is not ethical, for instance, I would argue, to uh, undersell the risk of a particular strategy with somebody who could lose everything if you failed. But on the other side of the coin, you've got that whole situation where a client doesn't understand the risks, doesn't want to listen, 
and you're saying don't do it, and effectively you're talking yourself out of business. The question is, what is the right ethical position to take there, bearing in mind you need to bring in revenue for the people who work with you? So, very muddy. Uh, just reiterating my point, uh, with this beautiful stock photograph of these gorgeous people, <laughs> it's all about the contract parties, really. In, in a very low-level sense, it's just who am I doing business with and, and who do I care most about? So I don't really care that much about Google on a near-term sense because they're not paying me directly. The person in front of me I'm doing business with does. So therefore, my ethical focus is with them. When we talk about our responsibilities, again, it's about, so I, my, my bottom line is don't be evil. Therefore, uh, they need to know stuff. But clients, we spoke about this earlier, didn't we? You had a client who was just, I want links. Now, just to explain, in search engine optimization, or to going back, a little mini history lesson, Google, was essentially founded on a patent which, uh, which is based around academic papers, actually. And as we know, with academic papers, the more often they are cited, the more prominent the paper is. They thought links, you know, the links you click on, they're like citations in academic papers. And the more a page is linked to, the more important the page is. And that, that dynamic has persisted to today, to today, but there are a lot of things that make it less and less easy to game the system. So for a long time, you could just game the system. Clients still think, because they're lazy in the way they think oftentimes, that links are going to be the answer to everything. They're the answer to some things, but it's, it's shades of grey. So a client wants loads of links. You're saying no, no, no. If you carry on saying no one more time, they're going to walk off and go somewhere else. And the question is, where ethically, where do you stand there? In my view, it's better to win the client and to steer them in the right direction in the end than to just let them walk away. Because otherwise they're going to hit a snake oil salesman and they're done. Uh, the eth so, so that's, so that a client is responsible for the welfare of those around them. And if they're given advice and they're told, if you do this, you will fall over, you will get a penalty, in my opinion and they go ahead with it, then it's their responsibility because they were told. As long as it's all written down and everyone knows. Again, the baseline is rules that are agreed to. And in a way, when you stick to that very simple premise, then the question of ethics gets really simple because it's what rules you agree upon. So the client who says, I want links, 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 if I go and say, right, if you do this, there's very high likelihood you're going to get a penalty, which means that because just to explain, links, acquiring loads of them, games the system. It artificially dif distorts things. Google then rank ranks a website more highly than it really ought to. And the person who owns a website is happy, Google is not, because the overall quality of their search results declines. So they don't like people gaming the system. But if a client signs up to it and says, yes, I'll do it, then ethically, I think I'm in a good place. If they fall over, because they insist on doing foolish things, then I'll pull out the document and say, you did, I did say, and you did sign, and that's where we're at. Because they're the rules that we've set, apart, set out between us. Okay, so one of the things that I've talked a lot about is setting up some sort of a framework by which we can agree these rules. Now, this isn't especially relevant to you guys, but uh, SEO is, full of shades of grey, as in very, the boundaries are very, very loose and so on. And if you believe in the idea that ethics are based on, on uh, agreements between each other, then, for example, if you had a trade association, that would formalise the code by which we work with clients and Google and so on. So in other words, we struck, create a, a universal set of agreements, or not rules, but conduct, uh, an approach to con conducting ourselves, which, uh, which then becomes our ethical position. And it's something I've always believed in, and hopefully at some point this is actually going to happen, where we actually have our own trade association. Funnily enough, 
golf green, golf green keepers have associations too. So I figure we could have one as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I've been an SEO practitioner since 2000 and I've seen strategies considered clean and safe turn into really risky ones as well as something that previously considered pretty risky turning into something pretty accepted and mainstream. So the question is, who is responsible for ethical SEO for, for maintaining the ethics of our industry. My opinion is definitely not Google. If, if you read really carefully Google Terms of Service, basically what it's all about is just one business establishing its relationships with other businesses. What they are liable for, basically they are not liable for anything. They are not to be held responsible for, for whatever risks, for whatever problems arise for any businesses, any any entities using their services and so on and so on and so on. So basically, they just wash their hands. Basically, what we see here, if we try to make Google responsible for the ethics, we get a conflict of interest. We have businesses versus Google, which is nothing more but another business ruling its actions by its own business interests, making profit for its shareholders, and doing whatever is in its shareholders' interest. One example, um, if you search for something like Google, shows you, first of all, a bunch of ads, then it guesses incorrectly that I'm in Vilnius and suggests me the flight from the news to New York. So that's the whole block of yet another ad under a different name leading to a Google property called Google Flights. Then only we get the first organic results. That's just before the, the, the cut of the screen. Below the fold, we get a bit more organic results. Then we get news scrape of uh, all sorts of news sites which is basically, again, repurposing other sites' content for Google purposes. And then again, we, we get more links to more Google pages, other searches related to, to the one that we've been running. Basically, Google just wants growth for Google. How does that fit in the picture of your business's growth? Just however you make it fit. So, uh, if you look through Google Webmaster Guidelines, which is yet another document regulating Google's relationship with the businesses trying to make their content or their websites visible on Google properties, what you get is a list of things to avoid. If you read through these things really carefully, um, I doubt any SEO practitioner worth their salt actually doing something that they are being paid for has never, ever, ever done any of these. Link schemes, well, basically any, any links are designed to make your sites rank can already be considered a link scheme. Sending automated queries to Google, okay, have you ever checked your rankings? outside of Google Search Console, then you're already sending automated queries and you're already violating something. Basically, the only, uh, I used to say when, when PageRank was still alive, the only, the only way to, to stick to Google Webmaster Guidelines is just sit there watching PageRank grow. So Google Webmaster Guidelines really have nothing to do with the ethics of SEO. They just lay all the responsibility on the site owners they even make you responsible for cleaning up your sites when they get hacked, when they get spammed, when, whatever bad happens to them. It's just your sole responsibility. User-generated content, you have to take care of that. And they just set Google's vision on how it will deal with other businesses. They just make things more convenient for Google, which again has nothing in it for your own business. 
Here we get to the practitioner responsibilities. As, a, as an SEO practitioners, I believe our responsibilities should be, first of all, to be qualified, really qualified to provide the services that we are trying to, to offer our customers. We should clearly understand the outcome of our own services before we offer them. We should not ever misrepresent our services. And we should explain the clients what they're going to achieve through our services, what they are not going to achieve, what is possible, what is not possible, what we control, what we do not control. So basically manage client expectations. As for the client responsibilities, some people claim that they have none. That is not completely true in my opinion. And the client responsibilities will really be asking questions from the SEO practitioners before hiring them, during the, the, the process of working with them, knowing what really is being done and why. We as practitioners should really educate our clients. What Nick mentioned about links may not be the actual solutions to uh, the actual solution to every problem. We should educate our clients about this. Uh, clients should also implement SEO practitioners' recommendations because what good is a site audit that I do that I spend twenty or more hours on, charge some hefty amount for, and then none of that gets implemented. So of course there's there's no ROI on my services for the client, and then they will blame me for getting nothing out of my services. So it is their responsibility to actually implement the recommendations that they are given. Clients, again, as a result of being educated by SEO practitioners, they should not expect any unrealistic outcomes. They should not expect to spend two days doing something and get the top rankings or top visibility or top uh, traffic levels. They should also understand cost to quality dependency. You cannot get really quality services by spending next to nothing. But unfortunately, uh, you should also really understand what you're paying for because there's uh, any number of dishonest SEO practitioners who will charge clients money, unfortunately, and not deliver the the actual services, or not deliver them properly, or be unqualified to do so. So, so it's all a uh, a mutual responsibility of clients and practitioners, I believe. But Google, we should keep that in mind, whatever they are saying. But we should really understand what's best for any particular client, and the clients should understand what it is that they are going to do, what are the risks, and what's the outcome, and what's the, the, the overall course of action. Generally, the more interesting SEO ethics questions that exist out there, but most people would not like to ask them, would be something like, would you SEO for a company whose products suck? Would you do SEO for a casino site targeting U.S. clients? Uh, Nick has mentioned uh, Bitcoin and then cryptocurrency. Uh, that's not a dig at Nick by any means. I love you too, Julia. Uh, not, yeah, I do, not, I do not really take any moral stance here. It's just yet another question when we talk about SEO ethics. Would you do reputation management for a client with really bad reputation? Would you care if this bad reputation is deserved? Would you investigate before taking up a client like that? Somebody did take an SEO job with Ryanair. Raise your hands if you do not hate Ryanair. <laughs> but the hands are all raised here. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> likes Ryanair? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No worries. Julia, th th thank you very much. That, that, that was brilliant. Uh, so we are now over. Uh, is that okay?
Uh, I will yeah. get to over to Sophie now for the fa uh, last contribution. Okay. So I'm uh, in my first year of my PhD um, studies. I've come back from working in the industry for about five years. I worked with Andy, actually. That's why I'm looking to get him out today. Um, so I obviously was kind of tired with some of the standards um, and practices and processes uh, within the SO industry and decided to come back and study it to see if I could help to, some, in some small way, contribute to improving practice and um, improving the quality of service for, for SEO clients because um, I think a lot, of, a lot of the time they're left in the dark. Um, so yeah, so I, in my studies uh, and in my research um, and like, you know, critical literature review, I've, I've identified some kind of key key groups who um, have some form of responsibility to, to SEO clients um, or, or the, the, the kind of ethical conduct um, and practices and processes that we should be implementing for our clients. Um, and the first one is Google. Um, we talked a lot about Google, some kind of very sort of polarised opinions within the panel already, but I, on, on a personal level, don't believe that they have any legal, moral or ethical obligation towards practitioners and towards clients. Um, it's their algorithm we choose to manipulate somehow, um, so yeah, we'll probably debate that a bit more. Uh, SEO agencies, practitioners and organisations, I do believe that they have an ethical obligation towards clients. Um, however, I think that the way we're going about it at the moment is wrong. Um, I've seen a lot of SEO agencies and practitioners, freelancers, develop their own form of ethical code or you know, professional code of conduct whilst there's an absence of, of it within the industry. Um, and in doing so, that effectively renders an ethical code um, inherently unethical. Because if we can create what these codes are, we each have our own independent code, that means that in times of crisis, we can call upon this this code and effectively absolve ourselves of any kind of poor poor practice, um, potentially. Um, and then I took a look at trade associations and trade institutes again, uh, the IDM, Chartered Institute of Marketing, a few other groups as well, like SEMPA, which is a is it an American trade association for the search industry. They all have their own individual code of conduct, uh, but I think it's the same kind of thing as you know, SEO agencies. There's no one trans you know. Uh, transcendent code of ethics for the industry so we can all create our own or create our own rules um, and also SEMPO has been criticised as, as having a bite without teeth what good is an ethical code if you have any kind of rules of governance to, to support that as well and, and you know if, if someone's behaving ethically how do they how are they reprimanded or where, where's the justice at the, at the back of it as well so that's an interesting point to raise too um, so practitioner responsibilities again um, Communication, um, the think about intimacy and the theme of this conference in particular. I've sort of well, we research professional intimacy, um, which is the, the the open communication between the client and the practitioner. That's really important. That's where ethical discussions can happen. Um, I think practitioners should have a plan B mentality um, because we don't know everything about the algorithm um, and we don't know general. We can't guarantee outcomes. It's a trial and error process. I think there has to be some form of, of uh, like, a, like a contingency, and a lot of agencies don't offer that to clients. Um, manage expectations, obviously, we've talked about that in detail between us all. Uh, and then I think a final responsibility of practitioners is to, to future gaze, uh, to future proof what we're doing. Um, I don't know if future proof is too much of a certain term, but future gaze in absolutely. Um, the algorithm changes 500, 600 times a year, apparently. Apparently it's thousands, it, there's lots of discussion over it. Uh, but we have to stay one step ahead and, and uh, protect our clients, because I know way back when Penguin was first launched, I think it caught a lot of practitioners and their clients off guard as well. Um, so then the final one, client responsibilities. Um, I don't think that they have any ethical responsibilities um, with regards to this conversation. It's, you know, they're, they're the point of contention at the moment. So I, I, I do think that they do have a, a responsibility, whether or not it's an ethical responsibility. Um, I think they, should, they need to keep on top of what SEO is. Um, I spoke to a lot of SEO clients who can hand over 25 grand in a year and they're not, not actually know what they're buying. Um, and just kind of get bought into the idea of, oh, you're going to get to the top of Google, you're going to be number one, and then they've actually not done any of their own research and they've been led astray. Um, so I think they, they need to stay stay on top of it, but well, that's kind of my understanding so far. Okay.
Okay. Are there any questions based on the uh, so sort of what what you heard so far uh, to to our panelists or any thoughts? Uh, yes, please. Just a, a, an observation. This is really really fascinating because uh, uh, my analogous experiences with the Association of Internet Researchers uh, and they were struggling with ethical guidelines for research as their practice starting in the late 1990s. And I'm, I'm picking up some analogs in terms of the ethical code starting to bubble up because you recognize you have a problem, or perhaps several problems. Uh, but it still seems like it's very early days in the conversations. Uh, so if you'll forgive my American optimism, be of good courage and it'll work out. <laughs> I hope. Yeah. Yeah, just, just an observation. Okay, thank you. So, so um, just a few, a couple of moments. Uh, I mean, this sounds like an IT field thing. Shouldn't BCS code be relevant? For this computing society, code of ethics, and code of practice. That, that's, um, yeah, it makes it, it's a kind of, uh, there hasn't yet been a discussion really about who, who is responsible. I mean, again, we're, we're kind of fragmented in our understanding of who we think is responsible. You think Google, uh, you know, I think the majority of us don't. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of groups who could be responsible for it, but there isn't a dialogue. There isn't an agenda to to discuss who, who could actually own that that code, if ever there could be. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the thing BCS, with the thing with uh, BC, if, if it's a British society, computing society, British Computing Society, right? So, in that arena, the paradigm is very different to this one. So, uh, you do build code. And, or they build code and they know what the code is and there are no secrets there. In this environment, we've got, an, we've got a prevailing power that's enormously secretive right. and is only interested in their own, their own interests, as it were. And they have relatively, the only time that they care about us is when it serves their interest. So the, the, the ecosystem is very different. And, uh, for example, with advertising, which is more linear, in that you buy advertising, there's the IAB, which is the, uh, is that what the advertising bureau? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the IAB, and, uh, and PR also has some very strong associations with it, within it. These prosper because there isn't this, in my opinion, there isn't this kind of overarching uh, opponent uh, and and there's transparency in the whole ecosystem, yeah. whereas in ours there's yeah. really very little transparency. I think as well that that whole overarching Terminator, uh, the overarching um, Google, mm. um, but SEO itself is is so fragmented in what it in what it is now. I'd probably say there's a clear idea of what SEO was about five years ago, um, and then all the algorithms came through, and then we've kind of it's, it's separated out into there are streams of digital PR, content marketing elements of social, it's and technical SEO is the same thing. I mean if anything it's we've cannibalized other channels. So it's it, it's is there a digital PR code, is there a content marketing it's just code? Marketing it's now, it? digital, yeah it's just it's such a broad fundamentally there's no thing. there's no fundamentally there is no absolute truth that we know of. Mm -hmm. the one organization does know their absolute truth but <laughs> <laughs> therefore everything becomes subjective. But and this is where it all gets a bit messy. The only time I've seen any outside body get involved is when I worked for a finance company around here and it was pre-Penguin but I imagine it still exists now is that because it was a financial institute there was a lot of lawyers involved in the company mm -hmm. day in day out and if they ever caught us linking or, or trying to do something manipulative against the competitor then they were worried we'd get sued or, or, or the, the banks would take away our licence and that's the only time I've physically been involved in an outside body getting involved with what we're doing online. I think it's really interesting as well that it's not just, um, we're not just looking at finance, we're, you know, we're looking at finance, we're looking at casinos and online gaming, and you know, we're looking at uh, sort of uh, holidays, holiday websites, there's, a, it's, it's, there's, there's so many different industries to consider and their own guidelines as well and how we don't conflict with those. Yeah. I think that's it's your question number two, I think, didn't you? No. Oh, so, so, just uh, Julia, do you have any thoughts on uh, if uh, British Computing Society should get involved with ethics? 
Or no, whether they're code of ethics. Well, but, um, to your they, support, they support British computing society sh should rather get involved with the fact that Google is effectively a monopoly. <laughs> I think the European Union is in the case. Uh, EU is not in that case. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. So there was some motion in that direction. So that's that's more of an issue, I suppose. Okay. My, my follow-up is kind of, um, I, I was thinking more on the level of client-vendor relationship because they, they have in their code things about that, like honesty towards the client and, and things like that. So that's why I was thinking on that level rather than on the Google <laughs> uh, overarching <laughs> monster level. So, so as in contractual, just con contractual yeah. guidelines. And yeah, ethical contra contractual guidelines rather than legal contractual. Yeah, uh, another thing that's fascinating about it might be just interesting for you to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We, so Sophie and I have been talking a lot about setting up a trade association, mm -hmm. and uh, and also with Julia as well, as it happens, and. The thing about this industry is it's, Google, I think if Google, would, Google A, they don't really care about this industry, per se. Secondly, uh, it serves their interests that were fragmented. And thirdly, because there are no clear borderlines around knowledge, because it's subjective, it's like who says and what kind of uh, empirical evidence is there in favor of blah, that it makes it really difficult for, for us all to gather together and actually set up a code that we all sign up to. It's a snake oil industry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm just going to say uh, I want to get to everybody. Uh, there were a couple of questions that I think you were first. Yeah, I understand. Partly being answered, I, I just wonder, we're talking very quickly, we use terms like don't be evil, I mean, to snake oil, mm. salespeople. Um, how much of it for you as professionals working in the industry is driven by your own personal moral, uh, ethical code and your own political views. I mean, Julia touched quite nicely upon reputation management and who she may or may not consider to be a, a reputable brand. As well as looking at it as a code across the industry, how much can personal influence um, come to bear in terms of the relationships that you have with clients? Or do you put that to one side for the, for the, for the good of the business outcome and then, as you say, try and educate from within? Okay, so I just want to chime in here because Julia's been relatively quiet. Julia is probably the most, one of the best known and one of the most successful black hat mm -hmm. SEO people in the game. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, if you don't know, there's this paradigm that Google has supported, which is that if you're a white hat, you support ethical SEO. In other words, follow Google's line. If you're a black hat, you don't, and therefore you're bad. You're either with us or you're against us, in other words. And Julia has lived in that space, which is so heavy on gaming Google that uh, you know, a lot of people just don't want to associate with her. Now, that's a very, you just asked a question about the personal ethics. Well, you know, a lot of people would say that her ethics are disgraceful. The fact that she will do whatever it takes to gain Google for results. Mm -hmm. So I would be very interested in hearing what you think about that, Julia. <laughs> Julia, did you hear that accusation? Uh, accusation yes, of uh, you wearing your black hat today. I, <laughs> as much of an accusation as, as, as a statement of, of the obvious fact. Uh, <laughs> there's a reason why I uh, try my best to, to, to keep black hat versus white hat argument out of this discussion altogether. Uh, First of all, uh, people who know me will know that uh, I hold that there is no white hat. And by showing the uh, Google Webmaster guidelines today, I have sort of proved that. Uh, as for the black hats, uh, there is this notion, or at least for some time, uh, there prevailed a notion in the SEO community, at least certain uh, circles of the SEO community, that black hats equals unethical. Well, uh, because Google has nothing to do with defining the ethics standards, Black Hat is just another method of achieving their goals. As long as you inform your clients about the risks and the possible outcomes, as long as you align the strategy with the actual approaches that you are taking, and when those approaches actually make sense, so if you're SEOing for somebody in the payday loans, 
or some other uh, highly competitive cutthroat industry. Uh, there is no way you would be able to do that using just something relatively clean. You would have to, to use whatever other competitors in that niche are using. Otherwise, you won't be able to successfully compete for them. So it's, it's not really about the hats. It's not really about black hat versus white hat. Uh, I suggest that for the sake of uh, the SEO community growing and some standards actually evolving, we retire this whole concept. Because it does more harm than good. Okay, so thank you for that de defense. I think there is uh, another couple of questions. So, uh, so uh, just on the, on the top, yeah. I'm, I'm just sitting here. I'm sorry, fascinated. But there seems to be <laughs> a number. There seems to be a number of stakeholders or actors, I think you've used in academia, in this study yep. that you've got. Is it almost an? Have you almost chosen an impossible PhD? Layers of opacity on yeah. top of opacity, and let's say just plain murkiness in other ways. <laughs> um, is it a PhD that you can do? It's, it's a PhD that I'm attempting, whether or not that's a good way of starting up. But um, it's, it's interesting you raise the stakeholder point. So, uh, the study moving forward uh, has stakeholder theory as a mm -hmm. theoretical framework that underpins it, um, and I'm trying to. You know, find a, an appropriate methodology to consider these stakeholder views. So uh, deliberative inquiry is, the, is the, the core, so more collaborative methods, trying to get everyone under one well, roof to kind of talk about the topic and see if we can't come to some sort of conclusion that works in everyone's favour. But again, that's, that's sort of the, the challenge moving forward. That could be brilliant or it could fall on its, on its behind. So, no um, well, we're so, trying to do a contribution to knowledge, not save the world. So I think that's the answer. Well, if, if I can, then that'd yeah. be good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but we will do our best to, to come up with something. Yeah. Uh, okay. So th there is uh, a question. Um, I, I'm just wondering. I read somewhere that uh, the domain name age counts a lot for rankings. Mm -hmm. So all the domain go give you more or bigger rankings than a new domain. No. Is that true or not? No. And if I would register a new domain today using white hat or ethical SEO, how how in order for us to love you, forget about the white hat thing, okay? okay. <laughs> um, how long like, would you tell your client would it take them for them to be on the first page or second page of Google? A year or you're asking tell you what. Afterwards, let's have a chat. <laughs> you're asking too many questions. Then, there's lots of stuff floating around. But, I mean, it is really but Julia will have some something to say about the the main name age because that's part of the well, shall we say not we 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 are not calling it black hat today, but actually buying up old domain names is part of your one of your strategies that you use to get something ranking pretty quickly. Instead. Is that a common technique to? get the domain names that have expired and try to re revitalize them? Is that what you do as part of your, so to say, shady actions? <laughs> <laughs> How shady is that really? I mean, if, if, if some company were some other company and repurposes their domain or just dissolve it all together, how unethical is that? So basically, what's, what's unethical about buying up domain? I don't know. Well, if, if that was an accident and the company wanted to buy it back and came back to you, would you give it back to them? Actually, uh, there was something like that in my experience, at least once. I bought a site that used to belong to a service editor who forgot to renew it. I restored all the content and was going to use it for my purposes and the solicitor comes threatening me. I say, uh, what's the problem? You just pay me the registration fee and I'll give it back to you because I spent money on registering it. I don't even charge you for restoring the whole domain or whatever. Uh, they took offense and never got back to me. They haven't sued me. But basically people think that it's my responsibility to remind them about them forgetting to renew the domains, is it? 
there is a comment to, to, to respond. I have a comment directly on this. I ran the previous HCC conference, and today when I went to the website, someone had bought it, and now it's uh, pushing stuff that I don't want to me. I, uh, whether that's unethical or not, at least... Uh, you should have let the domain expire. No, no, I, I, I don't mind. I don't, I, no, no. The, the, the point, I think that's very good. You just keep the ownership. No, no, that's not the point. The site itself is not valuable to me. The information there is old and it's out of date, even if it was my web page, and I don't care. The thing is, that which I did find kind of um, unpleasant of the experience was that some people may go to the previous website and expect to find that content, and uh, and instead of that, they are they are pushed basically crap to to it, it, there was nothing worthwhile seeing in that web page at all, and uh, and so they are pushed crap which they don't want. So they are being the the, the customers, the people who expect to find something are going to find quite something different. It's like it's like this is a crass comparison, but let's say some porn dealer had bought that, and it was a children's uh, conference site, and now it's full of porn. That would be unethical, in my opinion. Uh, just because you, you would expect that children would come to that page, and then if you would be blasting porn to their faces, that would not be a nice thing to do. Now, this is, of course, not quite that, but it's within the same vein of things, right? It, it, this is, yeah, uh, expired domains is a subject I also know a little bit about we do quite a lot of that as well, and uh, I, I agree. There is a set of, you know, we talk about ethics essentially being a set of rules. So a set of rules is don't do things like that if there's a risk that minors would be exposed to this kind of thing. I go, totally go with that. But that's, a, that's, a, that's like personal ethics, isn't it, as well? Exactly. There's, there's no but kind of you know, rules out there that, that say... Indeed, uh, the personal ethics are the foundation of good society. Yeah. So. Indeed. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, not, not at all. That would be the, I think... Uh, okay, how do you maintain control of the contents of the site that you no longer own? Sorry? How do you maintain control of, uh, of the website that you no longer own? That was the, the thought from of course you don't. That's, that's clear. It's there are ways of nuking a website. So well, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm to agree with you. Speak to Julia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we can introduce you to. Continue to renew a domain name is, is a good a good reason to stop to stop that kind of behaviour as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it costs money, but how much is it really costing? If you, if you think the maximum possibility of that happening, or you want to archive or just keep hold of that just in case, then just continue to renew the domain name. Please. But sometimes with large organizations like ours, mm -hmm. it, it's not you who is responsible, yeah. so there is the finance department that have given the credit card and they mm -hmm. no longer keep the, or the credit card expired and something, an email comes to them, they have no idea what's coming through, it's a large organization at all, yeah. it's just said, okay, they let it expire, so <laughs> if, if, it, if it's important, <laughs> then they'll come back to it. What, anyway, what, so. what we've started to do though now is buy up the domain name for 10 years rather than Absolutely. 2 years, yeah. at the yeah. beginning when you've got the money. <laughs> Should have done that, true. Well, in a large organization, to, to keep things running smoothly, uh, you should probably have some sort of unified web properties policy or something like that. I mean, I have seen sites uh, uh, seized by the FBI from, say, wares uh, providers or stuff like that, or tourist providers, and then FBI forgets to uh, renew those sites when they expire and somebody else buys it. I've seen one story turn really, really sore because one person who was not even aware of what that site previously was, he was made aware after the whole thing happened, bought a site in an auction, expired the names, and turns out it used to be a, a foreign site confiscated by the FBI that FBI then forgot to renew. And then FBI started blaming them because, of course, FBI cannot be made wrong. Uh, FBI started blaming this, this person for uh, serving up something something illegal on that site. Just to, just to seize that domain from this person. Okay, that's it. So who, who is the ethical one on, 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 in this story, in this case? Person who sold the site, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, Charles? Well, just a, a, a broader comment, um, um, and this comes out of experience with, with trying to teach research ethics or discuss research ethics. 
particularly with computer scientists and other professionals. Um, and one of the things that helps clear some of the ground is uh, all of us tend to come into ethics thinking about ethics as rules. Because uh, rules we understand. Uh, and particularly if we think in a kind of computational way, we understand how to go from sort of general principles and specify things and come to a conclusion. And that looks like ethics thinking. Uh, looks like most ethics thinking. So, so this, this is great. This makes sense. The problem is that there's a sort of field of ethical problems where we don't know which rules apply. So one of the, some of the examples you've brought forward, like uh, whose, whose interests do I balance? My company's interests or my client's interests? I would call that a problem of judgment. Uh, and judgment is probably not deterministic. It's probably not computationally tractable. Uh, it requires a lot of experience and a lot of pain, uh, a lot of discussion. Uh, but it's never perfect and it's never finished. And so, if we generally, when we find ourselves in these sort of places where we're not sure and we're asking questions, well, who to do, do, do? We're, we're now in a domain of, of judgment. And those judgments are often variable. And uh, 10 years later or five minutes later, you might look back and say, well, poop, I should have done this. That's, that's the human condition for ethics as something that is not fully capturable under a kind of rule-based approach. It's not to say there's anything wrong with the rule-based approach. It just doesn't get to these very gray areas which you're swimming in. Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, and it's the world that we inhabit within this industry. Sure. The way. And it's just, it is very, uh, it's, it's irritating because the industry as a whole doesn't get as well funded as other sectors because of the the, 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 the lack of clear parameters. Yeah. So uh, people see it as risky, therefore they don't put the cash in, and, and it just kind of goes on like that. And one of my long-held beliefs is that if you could build confidence in this industry, then we would all be better off. And yes. I can just add that. Sorry. Go on, Julia. Yeah, I can just add that. Surely, it would be nice to have some unified policy regulating how we approach things like that. But you probably just cannot regulate everything, and it's also the question of uh, personal uh, judgments, what, like uh, one of the uh, people in the audience just just mentioned. Uh, basically, if if I were a form site provider, I probably wouldn't uh, buy a domain that previously was used for some uh, children's stuff and serve up porn on there, but that's just me. I don't know, some others may have different judgments. Uh, basically, uh, talking about the age domains, are you as a domain purchasing customer of a registrar under any obligation to research the previous history of that domain before purchasing it. And what do you find there? How does that influence your decision about the domain purchase, the purchase and further use? So that, that's, that's, that's not an SEO, that's, that's more of a question to the registrars. Thank you.